Hello everybody, this is Andrew Hyde. I run Ignite Boulder out of Colorado, and I wanted to welcome you this week to the show. This week we have John Kahan, who is talking about cutting edge technology. And it's probably not the cutting edge technology you're thinking about. We're talking samurai swords here. So enjoy the show. Ignite is an ongoing series of speedy presentations. They've ranged from building multi-person pogo sticks to hacking chocolate, any topic that geeks hold dear. Each speaker gets only five minutes and 20 slides at auto advance every 15 seconds. The talk you're about to hear was recorded live at one of the featured Ignite events around the world. Hi, my name is John. I'm here to talk to you about samurai swords. And um, yeah, uh, samurai swords uh, are an important part of the cultural legacy and history of Japan. Uh, and they're known as the soul of the samurai. Uh, they weren't always the primary combat weapon, but they were uh, probably the most iconic and important. And they're pretty freaking cool. I think that's, that's a technical term. Most connoisseurs think uh, samurai swords are pretty cool uh, because they have the ability to make anything uh, cool. Samurai swords, uh, you know, plus your living room equals cool. Uh, going to the dentist plus samurai swords theoretically would equal cool. Uh, paying taxes plus samurai swords, for example, uh, plus uh, equals cool. For God's sakes, Tom Cruise plus samurai swords equals cool. That should be impossible. So clearly something is going on here that's out of the ordinary. Uh, what is it? Well, we have a bit of a, a fascination uh, in, in our popular culture with samurai swords, whether we, whether we realize it or not. Um, you know, Star Wars, Kill Bill, anime, they all have this idea of this perfect blade that can cut through anything. And that's cool. I mean, everybody loves that, but it sort of obscures uh, just how, uh, how cool these things were in real life, uh, historically speaking. And that has to do with uh, their manufacture, how they were made. Uh, now, if this gentleman who looks very upset is trying to run at you and kill you and cut your head off, you have to cut his head off first. How do you do that? He's wearing a steel helmet, steel armor. You need to be able to cut through that, and that's not so easy. You need something very, very sharp. Uh, the problem is things that are sharp are hard, and things that are hard are brittle, and things that are brittle break. And uh, if you're trying to attack some pissed off samurai guy and your sword shatters like glass, you're gonna die, and that's no fun. Uh, so you can't have a flexy, bendy sword either because that's incapable of taking a very sharp edge. Uh, so what do you do? Well, if you're a, uh, a swordsmith in about 980 Japan, you figure out you can take a soft inner core of steel and wrap it in a jacket, a uh, hard outer jacket of steel, and you can bend that into a samurai sword, and now you have a sword that resolves this sort of swordsmith paradox. You're able to kick some serious ass without having your sword break. Uh, pretty cool technical in innovation for pre-first millennium AD Japan. Uh, but it's not only this, uh, <laughs> it's not only this uh, two-layer system that's going on, uh, you can see in the next slide here the tempered edge of the sword. Uh, that's because the outside of the sword is made of one piece of steel, uh, but it's technically, chemically, two pieces of steel. WTF, how do they achieve this? Well, they figured out that, that's Japanese, uh, they figured out that you can, uh, you can cover your sword in clay, which you see here, clay and ash, a secret patented mixture depending on what samurai lineage you come from. And, uh, and then at the key moment during um, the quenching process, you superheat it and then dunk it in a bucket of water and, uh, and the crystal pattern of the metal forms. And because of the differential way the clay is applied, it cools differentially and forms two different types of metal on the same piece of metal. Pretty freaking cool. I don't know where they learned that. They did not have Wikipedia. You can kind of see over here, they have, uh, the, the, you can see discrete particles of martensite along the edge of the sword, so it stays very sharp. But the rest of the sword is, uh, is, is perlite or ferrolite, of course. Uh, here we can see the katana, probably the most popular sword in the popular imagination today. Uh, it appeared around 1500 AD during an age of uh, civil war in Japan. It was about 150 years of mass head chopping and bloodletting, wonderful things like this. And, uh, and we can see it being worn here in the traditional way. And why is this important? Well, it, like all Japanese swords, but particularly this one, is curved. Uh, and it's worn with the curve and the edge up like this, through your sash. And why is that important? Because uh, the curve functions as part of the circumference of a larger circle of death that emanates from your scabbard with the center of the circle at your right shoulder so you can kill people really quickly, which is very nice. Um, and, uh, and that's a lot more convenient than pre-1500 when there was a mass age of uh, horseback warfare and things like that, like this gentleman over here. Uh, you had to, it was two discrete motions. So if you had to kill peasants, you had to unsheathe your long sword and then reach down and kill the peasants. Now you can kill the peasants immediately, which is, you know, nice, especially if you're that guy. Um, so Th those are two very, uh, important technical innovations about the samurai sword. Uh, another interesting thing to note is that in a pre-machine age, uh, this was all done by eye. Of course, if you, I, you know, I defy anybody to pick up a blade from mm, 1400 and not say it do doesn't look uh, perfectly laser machined. It's uncanny how they were able to judge carbon content, temperature, all this stuff by eye. Uh, I have no idea how they did that. 
Uh, you have a bit of a breakdown here of the parts of the sword, which would be top, the topic of an entirely separate lecture, but it is a very complicated instrument, um, even though it's made from traditional materials. Uh, and uh, you can kind of see that the, the scabbard is separate. Now this slide, not such a stretch. Uh, this was a highly evolved technology and there were many different so uh, swords for many different uses. Uh, you can see here, I mean, if you have your long sword, your katana, you walk into somebody's castle, you're not gonna be rude, you leave it at the door, but you still have your wakizashi, your tanto, in case you have to assassinate somebody or commit suicide if you dishonored yourself, you never know what could happen. Uh, also, a uh, little known fact, there are more antique blades in the US than in Japan, which means a surprising number, maybe people here uh, have these things rotting away in their attic from you know wherever, uh, I urge you, if you have one or know somebody who has one, look it up, Wikipedia, learn how to preserve it, because it'd be sad if it just dies uh, after being handed down for so many generations. So I hope you've enjoyed this really, really quick talking talk about what uh, a famous swordsman called, uh, some, uh, not as uh, random or clumsy as a blaster, but a civilized weapon, an elegant weapon for more civilized age. Thank you.